welcome to everyone. It's really, really lovely to have you here. Um, just before the Easter break, so well done for making it. Um, I wanted to welcome you all. We're here to see the integrating connected packaging for effective packaging design. So really looking forward to getting stuck into this. But before we do, just a quick few notes. Uh, first of all, this is a recorded webinar. So that means that you can obviously see this later on, on catch up or um, on YouTube. It's also going to be recorded on podcast as well. So you have the ability to be able to hear this on the Talking Giraffe. So I've got some fantastic panelists with me here today. Luca Beltrami, thank you very much for joining us from Ad Studio. Adrian Hi. Tennant, thank you very much for joining us from Big Eye. Eric Sorensen, thank you very much for joining us. Jennifer, also from Patch and Pieces, thank you very much for joining us all today. Well, we wanted to also let you know that this is an interactive webinar. That means everybody is very happy to answer your questions. So to please make this an interactive webinar. Do ask your questions. You just need to do so in the Q&A uh, box, which you should be able to see uh, down below, which means that you can ask those questions and we will get to your panelists as quickly as possible. So as we start, we're going to be looking at, as I said, integrated connected packaging for effective packaging design. We've got lots of things to get through on the agenda with our fantastic panelists today. And first of all, we're going to have an introduction to connected experiences in packaging design. So this is a really interesting question. And thank you, uh, Adrian, uh, for, for joining us and willing to speak about this fantastic uh, subject today. Basically, we have a fantastic set of panelists that we are going to be going through everything today on. And um, I just wanted to also thank Adrian for joining us because it's 5.30 uh, in the States at the moment. So uh, fantastic that you've been able to get up early for us. Thank you so much. What we're talking about today, of course, is connected experiences in, in packaging design and why connected experiences and QR codes matter. Um, and really it's important for us to think about this, that packaging is much more than just a shell. It's an introduction, the first impression, the chance to create an impression or influence a decision. These little squares, these QR codes are often overlooked. And obviously that's what we're here to talk about today. So these secret doorways can help us to bridge between the consumer and the brand. The connection between the digital digital and physical world. So Adrian, fill in some gaps from us. Tell us a little bit about the potential for, for QR codes here. Yes, well, happy to, Jenny, and thanks again for inviting me. Um, as a strategist, I think QR codes unlock many opportunities for deeper engagement with brands. Um, for challenger brands especially, connected packaging and the information it links to can help build trust with consumers who may be less familiar with the brands because often these challenger brands don't have the mental availability of larger traditional competitors, of course, with bigger marketing budgets. The same goes for FMCG brands, or as we call them here in the States, CPG brands that are produced sustainably. So if you're an organic product, for example, you definitely want to be able to tell your authentic story from the farm to the consumer's table, especially if you have a special certification on greenhouse gas emission reduction metrics, you know, around your production methods, you know, that, those kinds of things can be a significant differentiator in the category. So many brands, of course, use the various organic certifications on pack. But similarly, I think there's potential to highlight the inclusion or exclusion of specific ingredients for folks who are sp uh, following special diets, you know, or like me, just using apps like Yucca to make better informed selections when I'm at the supermarket. So it's hard to tell these kind of complex stories entirely on pack. So thoughtfully integrating QR codes into packaging design can link to mobile sites, food ingredient lab test results, you know, and let's not forget short consumer surveys, turning everyday packaging into interactive platforms that do foster a sense of community, loyalty, and importantly, trust among consumers. Definitely. I mean, you mentioned a lot of different things there. Food ingredients, um, so, so important. 
Um, obviously, people who may be gluten free, um, who might be vegan or religious reasons, etc. So a really easy way um, to be able to understand. So that makes perfect sense. If you're at the store scanning different product packages, the ability to be able to understand that makes so much sense. And then, as you say, the ability to have an interactive platform. Um, there's a whole host of magic that can happen behind that that QR code. It's not just about slapping a QR code on the box and linking to a website and thinking that that's the job done. It really is about a, an engaging journey. I think that's what we're talking about, the ability to be able to amplify uh, the brand, uh, be able to really connect beyond what meets the eye. And, and, you know, there's that whole piece. There's so much that needs to go on packaging, but so much that there isn't space for. Um Adrian, have you got any examples of brands getting this right? Yeah, you mentioned in your introduction, you know, the, the merging of the physical and the digital world. I think several brands have realized leveraging QR codes is a really great way to do this. For example, uh, thinking of Lego and their city kits, they have QR codes right there on the packaging. If you have a smartphone with the free Lego Builder app, Pointing at the QR code unlocks gameplay associated with that product. And unlike when I was a kid, when you had to follow instructions on paper, today you can learn to build Lego kits by following interactive missions displayed on your phone. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, I think you've got an example uh, from Appetite Creative that you you guys developed for the Spanish juice brand Don Simon promoting its first ever 100% environmentally friendly and smart packaging. Now, I like this because it combined genuinely innovative packaging with an engaging and educational web experience. And Jenny, I understand you created this in such a way that the, br the brand itself was able to track real-time interactions, including buying habits, product preferences, engagement time and social media shares and i think you can see from the example here it was also a fun game to play so as a strategist i really appreciated the way that the connect the connected packaging and the content it linked to um, could help the brand optimize its marketing and gain a deeper understanding of the consumer behavior i also like to see qr codes used on samples now today sample packs don't just live in the supermarket, they might be distributed in locations like co-working office spaces, gyms, concerts, or sporting events, or places where the consumer can't immediately purchase from a physical store. So this example uh, shows one treatment for connected packaging that you guys did, but of course the QR code can lead to a site where the consumer can purchase directly from the brand or through a partner, and what I really like here is that sale is directly attributable to the sampling. You mentioned some some great ones there, especially the Lego makes me think of IKEA, um, an adult version. Um, IKEA furniture probably ends up in the bin when I've uh, bought it in the past and I just couldn't do it, right? So I just got fed up. Um, but being able to see a video, being able to put that together, I suppose is the adult version, or maybe adults like Lego too, right? But the adult version of what you're saying um, in terms of that kind of gameplay or, or, or completing missions, which is which is fab. Um, thank you, of course, for mentioning um, the Don Simone and the environmental. I think it's a really interesting one because had we not put the QR codes onto that packaging, the consumer would never have known that that packaging was 100% was aluminium free. It looks like all the other packaging. So a great way to be able to tell a story, uh, which is what you were mentioning. And then sampling. I love the idea that all sampling companies will understand this. The whole point of a sample is to purchase the product, right? If you like it. So uh, allow people to do that immediately. And then as you say, being able to report that to be able to know how successful your sampling was. Otherwise, how do you know how many customers you got from the sampling? So it makes absolute sense what you're saying there. So thank you for that. You know, this is this is ongoing relationships as well. This could then be the ability to share stories, exclusive content, get feedback. What did you think of the product? Maybe they're not going to buy the product, but maybe you could incentivize them to tell you why. Um, you know, talking back around that measuring of success though, right? How many, how many people actually purchase my product based on this? You know, this is really, really important. And I think there's a great opportunity here. Adrian, what do you think about that? How can brands measure the success and the effectiveness of, of their connected packaging initiatives? 
Well, you said it's an important question. You know, I've yet to work with a brand marketing team that doesn't have to report on the results of its initiatives. So quantifying the value of connected packaging is absolutely critical to getting buy-in for the continu continued investment in content, not just from the marketing team, but also from the C-suite. Mm -hmm. So as everybody on this call knows, the blessing and curse of digital data is that there is so much of it. So I think we need to narrow, I think we need focus. As a starting point, I would look at measures like scan rates, engagement levels with the digital content and consumer feedback, which you can track via surveys. Then determine which of these are leading indicators in your specific context. So if you're doing any kind of marketing mix modeling or media mix modeling, depending on your tech partner, you may also be able to ingest data from con connected packaging as inputs for the models that predict the most optimal channel selections you're making as a marketer. So while well, QR codes can definitely provide valuable insights into consumer behavior and preferences, I think we should think more expansively about connected packaging as an owned media channel. Yes, an owned media channel. Absolutely. It is something which is in the consumer's house for depending obviously on, on on the product but a few days a week a month and and you can actually engage with that consumer several times so if you can understand as you say that consumer behavior when are they consuming the product what do they think about the product how do they like the product yeah being able to predict uh optimal channel selections being able to predict or just ask the question do you prefer a strawberry flavor or a avocado flavor milk, you know, it's, it's absolutely, absolutely key. Um, and do you know what's amazing? It's win-win because the consumers get more immersive, personalized experience and the brands get a chance to then forge stronger connections and, and stand out um, in the marketplace. Adrian, which industry verticals do you think are leading the way in integrating connected experiences effectively? And which ones do you think you can predict will be most impacted in the future as well? Mm. Well, at Big Eye, we work extensively with CPGs in the health and wellness space, grocery brands and pet care, both at the product and retailer levels. And these are all excellent candidates for connected packaging. And many of the folks on this call and listening to the podcast later are probably familiar with a lot of these use cases. But in terms of leading verticals, I think uh, some fashion brands have adopted connected experiences, not least because younger consumers, of course, are glued to their smartphones already. Mm -hmm. and, in, and they expect to interact with brands and even shape the narratives around how they show up in the culture. So, I mean, Patagonia is often given as an example, but really any fashion brand that has products with a QR code as part of the care label, for example, or box if it's a pair of shoes, they can collect information across all points of sale and potentially for the life of that garment or apparel. Mm. So that's even including even when it's resold. So think of the resale case here and or passed along to another member of the family who hasn't uh, ever had a hand-me-down. But you could do that. Um, I think whether products are sold by a third-party retailer or purchased directly from a brand's app, website, or a physical store, brands can still present their information to consumers, updated as appropriate, and collect information from them. Of course, the model can be applied to the verticals as well. Um, you asked me maybe emerging use cases. Well, I, I think as more consumers use wearable devices like smartwatches and Fitbits, to track their health. Uh, think about over-the-counter pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical brands, vitamins, sports supplements, all of these stand mm -hmm. to gain the most because consumers are seeking more transparency around ingredients, sourcing, testing, nutritional information. You know, they also want more personalized experiences with information that's tailored to them. Yes, absolutely. And I think consumers are, are becoming more demanding. And and so they should, as, as we're all consumers as well, right? We all have two hats to wear here. But I want to know what's what's in my product. I want to know where it's come from. I want to know what I'm going to be giving my child. Is this good or not? And then if you can 
tailor that to be a personalized experience because you know that my child is a, a, a daughter, for example, then obviously that's going to make me more attracted to that brand. Um, I love what you say about um, all of the nutritional, um, you know, diet, protein, all of these big things that are coming up as well. There's huge opportunities. We've got a, we've got a question actually from the audience. Um, I'm going to throw it to you, Adrian, but uh, <laughs> let's see how you go. So Philip Bassendale asks, do you have any specific examples of the percentage of consumers actually scanning the QR codes versus the sales volumes? I have an answer if you need help. Uh, well, it's very category specific. So yeah. Jenny, I'm going to I'm going to revert to you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's category specific, 100%. It also does depend on um, the marketing support that's been put behind it. Uh, which is a really, really important part. So, and then of course we can talk about region specific. Um, however, in general, in average, across everything, we know that we get about a 20% increase in sales um, when we are running the QR uh, campaigns or strategies year on year. So in comparison, so about 20% is kind of the the um, sales, sales volume increase. But as you say, Adrian, that does change more and more on depending on the industry vertical. And then finally, depending on the incentive, if you offer nothing, you're going to be on the lower scale. And if you offer a Ferrari for every person who scans, guess what? You're going to get a lot. So obviously, um, obviously, there is a, a, a dependent there um, and, and, and a variable. But hopefully, um, Philip, that answers your question a little bit. Any other questions from the audience, please do do bring them forward. We're very excited to hear them. But Adrian, how do you see the role of QR codes evolving um, in packaging design over the next few years? So I, I see that from COVID, we've had this huge increase, which is fantastic. And I've said to you before, I've been talking about QR codes and talking about QR codes for like eight years. And finally, finally, there seems to be all of these brands and all of these consumers really interested in it. But what's what's happening? Uh, what's happening in the next few years? Well, in Europe, you've got the digital product passports coming, right? So that's going to be a big change for you. But I think as more brands use connected packaging, QR codes will not just become accepted. I think they'll kind of become expected, right? I think we'll see them being used for more than just linking to websites, like some of the examples we've been discussing already. Think interactive tutorials, multi programs, augmented reality experiences that start from the packaging itself. Again, I'm shameless plug for Lego here, but rather like the what's inside the box augmented reality that visitors to Lego stores are probably already familiar with, or virtual try ons, you know, like Warby Parker's app that lets you see what different eyeglass frames look like uh, on your face. I'm also curious to see how connected packaging will evolve to work side alongside emerging retail technologies uh, like cooler screens, which can reach in-store shoppers with dynamic digital advertising, uh, like on the freezer doors that Cooler is known for. And in the US, we've seen tests of ads based on consumers' facial expressions captured on camera as they approach the shelf. Uh, their emotions revealed by their facial muscles determine the ad they're exposed to. I'm just gonna say, I'm not sure those would fly in the EU though. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. That sounds really freaky, but <laughs> it would make you just want to smile. So, so it might be quite nice because it might make people happier <laughs> in their daily life. Um, what about continuous innovation? You've talked about something really exciting there, I think. What about other emerging technologies or trends that brands should be keeping an eye on to stay ahead in this realm of connected packaging? Okay, well, I'm going to be the first person to say the word artificial intelligence. There, I did it. Okay, <laughs> now we can all relax because somebody said the word. All right. Well, AI is already helping us analyze the vast quantities of data that connected packaging in all its forms generates. But I think we're also seeing the development of many app-specific or domain-specific AI assistants that help us marketers plan, execute, and optimize campaigns and connected content that the packaging directs consumers to. So I mentioned marketing mixed modeling a bit earlier. AI has really had a significant impact on speed to insights. It helps us not only understand the incremental contribution of online and offline marketing, but the optimal balance between those upper funnel awareness driving initiatives and bottom of the funnel conversion focused tactics. So I think MMM can 
certainly help us all, everybody on this call probably. I also think we'll see more sensors embedded in packaging to monitor the condition of the product, you know, thinking about temperature or freshness, mm -hmm. which will be particularly useful for food and pharmaceutical products. And of course, from a sustainability perspective, these kinds of technologies can help prevent food waste and ensure product quality. So more generally, I think the lines between marketing and sales will blur as more investment goes to retail media networks. That's mm -hmm. certainly a big story here in the US might be a topic for another time. Uh, and I was reading just yesterday about how Mars's snacking unit, uh, which is uh, responsible for brands like M&Ms, Snickers and Skittles, is using AI-based virtual testing and prototyping for its packaging. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than purchasing large amounts of plastic or whatever material it plans to use, then creating a mock-up of the packaging and putting it through several physical tests, the Mars team is now using AI to simulate the performance of different materials with the aim of being more sustainable. So overall, I think my hope is that we'll move beyond viewing connected packaging as a marketing tactic mm -hmm. to something way more holistic, You know, recognizing that it's a strategic channel that mm -hmm. has a real impact on the business. Yeah, absolutely. Some some great examples. And I didn't know um, about the, the Mars uh, there. That's quite interesting. I'm going to go and investigate that a little bit more. But yeah, I absolutely agree with you. This is a strategic channel. Um, it's not just about the product inside. It's about the journey that you're inviting the customers, the consumers to take, the stories that you share, the narrative, the connections that you build, the CRM, of course, the data. Um, so what we're talking about when we talk about QR codes is they're not just squares. These are gateways to a world of endless possibilities waiting to create memorable, enjoyment, informative uh, moments between the brands and their audience. So thank you so much, Adrian. You have brought some really great uh, points to the fold here. So that is a great introduction, I think, to the power of connected experiences in packaging and design, bridging the gap. So now we need to think about those squares. So how can we get that right? So thank you, Adrian, and welcome to Luca and Jennifer to our virtual stage. Really lovely to have you here uh, with us today. What we really want to then look at is QR codes, um, best practices, uh, practices, sorry, in packaging. So we want to zoom in to the art of making QR codes, not to just make them functional, but actually make them fabulous on your packaging. So Luca, Tell us, what are some key considerations for brands when implementing these QR codes, these squares uh, in their packaging design? What, what should they be thinking about? Well, first of all, uh, the, um, the, uh, the key is the accessibility of the, of the QR code. Uh, um, you, want, uh, you want it, uh, it, it must be visible, but you don't have to scream. Uh, it must be recognizable and uh, you don't have to, to search it. Imagine uh, you are uh, in, um, in a store, uh, you, don't wanna, you, you are expecting, as we said before, uh, a QR code, but uh, I have to check, I have to turn my arms. And uh, in, in general, we, you, we used to place it accessible. I think you're right. You, you're saying it's got to be visible. If, you, if people can't see it, they're not going to be able to scan it, right? Yeah. So that's 101. So let's make it visible, distinctive, easy to reach, some really nice uh, examples there. And then let's talk about strategic placement. How can we maximize that visibility? Um, what do you think? You know, you've created some nice slides here. Talk us through these. Yeah, the, 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 the barcode is an, is an example because uh, it's something that uh, uh, must be present on uh, commercial packages, but it's being customized as well. Uh, the QR code can be customized in terms of, uh, uh, of the overall look. It, they are basic uh, all uh, square um, surfaces, but they can be customized accordingly with your product. So they can become a dog, an ice cream, uh, a bottle or, or a milk jar, for example. Yeah. And this is a way, a nice way to integrate your QR code on your package because it's not just a square stamp, but it becomes part integral of your package design. Yeah. And it also becomes even more attractive because people mm -hmm. are getting curious about what is going to be after the scan of these uh, 
of this QR code. Absolutely. And... I love I love the little dog one. <laughs> it's so <cute. laughs> Yeah. Maybe if you if you are a pet food producer, this is a nice way to to enhance and show how your product can help your uh, your dog health or whatever. Or maybe another way to prepare ice creams or uh, or introduce the people maybe on a new product and show the world behind. As we, we talked before about the, the sampling, this is a way to, to present a new product and show the world behind this new product by a connected uh, package experience. Absolutely, absolutely. This is really, really helping, I think, bring attention to it. But also yeah. avoid what I hear some brands say, which is, oh, it's really ugly. We don't have to be ugly. That dog does not look ugly. He looks cute. Um, and the cow eating eating the barcode, that looks cute. Yeah. Some really nice ways to be able to integrate that. So it can be customized and we're not, you know, we're not taking away from the QR code in any of these um, elements, but there's some great customization there. Talk us, talk us a little bit here in terms of effective effective techniques uh, and, and optimization. Yeah, it, the QR code can become part of the of the world design as we saw before, as we see in, the, in this uh, example on the on the right, it becomes the point of the exclamative point. So you um, as you read the head of the of this uh, the unpack, you you get the input to to understand what is uh, the reason behind this communication. Another way uh, we always suggest to our clients is to use a short URL because mm -hmm. uh, a, a longer URL means uh, a, a very much complex QR code which requires uh, uh, a bigger space. So we said it's not nice to, to scream to, to the user uh, in face of the user and the big QR code uh, is perceived uh, as a as a screaming way to to say hey please scan me so <laughs> no using screaming. A, yeah using a shorter rule you can have a simple QR code and this allows to to play even more with the design and to integrate it much better in your uh, on your product and uh, for, for sure the the sharpness of the QR code is crucial. It must be easy to scan. So one of the most common practices we we do is to to test it, taking the 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 phone and, and making a test. If you have a completely reflective surface, it can become harder to scan. So you have to yeah. make a step behind. A step back and, and and return to 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 the design process in order to uh, to to achieve your 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 target. Yeah. And uh, another point is to uh, if you if you decide to to make a connected package experience, you have to give the right space to your QR code. Yeah. Uh, usually, uh, on on packages and, and above all for for the food, we have uh, a lot of information, uh, such like uh, the the ingredients, uh, the, the nutritional uh, values, and whatever. And we want also to add the QR code, so it's relevant to 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 manage the the elements on the package design in order to to make it visible and do not uh, leave it lost in all the elements that are already present on the on the package design. Uh, absolutely. So there's some some really good points there making it making it visible but not bulky, making sure that yeah. the URL is not too long so therefore the QR code doesn't have to to have to be so big and and scream. I love that you said there. Maybe you can tell us about um this campaign. This is a really successful uh campaign. Talk us through it. Yes, this is this has been one of our first experiences with the uh, with QR codes, and uh, this is um, a, an activity by my Annie. The it was a contest, a very easy contest, where uh, with an instant winning uh, yeah. contest, and uh, it's been 
so much uh, successful that uh, it's been repeated the, the year later. In this case, we can see the first version of the of the competition where uh, the, there was a smartwatch. And in, in terms of QR code placement, uh, we placed it uh, right uh, exactly closer to the um, to the mechanics on the front of the package. This is a competition. The objective is to rise the, the sales of the product. So it's important to, to place a, a, a banner on the front to explain, to, to inform the, the consumers about this, uh, this activity running. And the QR code is uh, right behind on the side panel where you simply what with a simple gesture you already access to the QR code and with all the most relevant information about uh, the, the expiration date of the activity and whatever and in this way in the same way as we done uh, the following year where we, we where we did uh, even more visible banner and uh, the, the the QR code placement uh, was the same because uh, it was working. Mm -hmm. And uh, one side note uh, is that the the client accepted to refuse to some of the contents of his package design to leave the right space to the um, to to the activity, because in this moment, in this particular moment of the of the product, uh, it was most more relevant to, to promote the activity more than say that the milk comes from uh, the that specific region. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I mean, we, we didn't know this when we first met, but we actually then, of course, built the the experience behind this that you actually did the design board with the QR packaging. Yeah. We, we didn't know that when we met each other. So that was really interesting. And I love to hear the fact that actually they thought of, they, they thought that it, the promotion space was more important than some of the other facts on, on, on the packaging. And you're absolutely right. Of course, they repeated it and continue to repeat uh, the connected packaging because it does work uh, really well. I remember very well this, this campaign uh, it was it was working with over two and a half minutes of engagement time per per scan as well. So obviously, if you can get the placement right, you've got the people there to be able to engage with great content. So really, really nice um, when I saw that this was the um, campaign that you were talking about. So it's a it's definitely a small world in the world of QR codes, at least. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Luca. You've really You're really welcome. given us some 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 great tips here. Thinking about the space thinking about the length of the URL, thinking about integrating it into the design. Um, I think that's a really good point as well. This just doesn't have to be just slapped on there. It can be actually integrated and created um, as part of the design um, itself. So thank you, Luca. I'm going to move to Jennifer now. Jennifer, you're going to tell us lots of fantastic things, but welcome very much to our, to our virtual stage. Let's delve into the magic of call to actions really really important what would you talk about in terms of strategies for recommending call to action so we can see some some of those which obviously luke has taken us through some of these examples what, what would you say how, how do we get something that's catchy um and right for the brand i think firstly um i think luca's presentation has has helped and um, adjusted some of my notes because one thing that i haven't made note of is as a brand it's I think we where you need to start off is it's knowing the packaging prototype. So how a lot of us hold your packaging to start off with. Um, so Luke had mentioned um placement around you know the positioning of QR codes on a packaging. So as a consumer, we're all consumers, when we buy products, we don't instantly go looking for QR codes. No. You know? It's not something that we naturally do. So what you want to do is position your QR code in a placement where it's going to be visible um, and it's also going to be catchy. So what you want to do is avoid placing the QR codes next to text heavy content. Um, that's easily going to be missed, especially if you've got a lot of like um, sustainability, recycling logos um, positioned on, a, on the same particular side alongside the, the barcodes. You don't want it to be super, super heavy where it can be missed. Um, but um, another key thing to mention is how do we align it with brand messaging? So um, first off, it's knowing your customer and the consumer behavior. So for example, I'm going to throw KitKat out there because I think they 
were quite successful in their strategy around their QR codes. So we all know what Kit, what Kit Kat looks like in terms of the chocolate bar. So if we can imagine the Kit Kat bar, what they did is Nestle inserted the QR code at the front and how they positioned it is Kit Kat's got their, their part of the messaging is take a break. So what they encouraged their audience, well, their consumers to do was on their break, scan this code. And then on that QR code, it will then take them onto a YouTube link where they can enjoy the product alongside their time away from work, time away from, from, from life, essentially. So that was that was a successful campaign for them because mm-hmm. it aligned with their brand um and the messaging behind you know take a break so um i think i always use kitkat as a great example for ways to implement qr code well qr systems um at tying well with the brand messaging yeah ab- absolutely and i think we just kind of touched a little bit um I-, I threw it up on the screen but um i just wanted to kind of when you mentioned a little bit about the space um, I really think that this is a, a great example of, of not putting your QR code next to loads and loads of, of, of text. You know, this is a fantastic um, example of where, you know, we can avoid uh, overload to that consumer and getting that space. Um, yeah. a fantastic example of that. And then, as you say, integrating it into part of the of the story, into the narrative of kick yeah. make absolute sense. Yeah. Um, Luke and Jennifer, I've I've got a slide, so I know you guys are going to talk about this. But tell me about the pitfalls. Um, you know, tell me what what mistakes are made. Uh, apart from the one that I've mentioned, which is placement, especially around congested parts of the packaging. Um, a common mistake again, it's not knowing your prototype. I would probably say, you know, it's. QR code should be quite should be placed in isolated places, ideally more at the front. Um, initially, I, I do see a lot of QR codes being placed at the back, which is not so bad, especially for if we're looking at alcoholic brands in particular. Um, a lot of times, as a consumer, you are going to revert back to the back if you need to look at key stuff uh, or key, key information. Um, but at times, it can be missed and. It's more on products such as like cartons, like discs, boxes in particular that have so many faces that it's getting that right. But then again, you do have an advantage of utilizing the space around the whole box. Um, I'm not too sure if Luke has got any additional comments to make around placements on this. Well, one of the most common issues I I used to find on, on packages design is to find uh, Queer coat left by itself, uh, like the, the one we can see in the lower part of the design, where the users don't know what to do, can't, can't imagine what to expect. That one, exactly. You, yeah. you, you see a package of design and, and you see a QR code. <laughs> and maybe, maybe you can also try to, to scan it because you're curious or whatever, but then you get the access to a not responsive website. It's a really bad experience because uh, the the consumer uh, must be every time somehow rewarded. And uh, in the most simple example of the link to a website and getting the access to a website which is not responsive for your device, it's a very bad experience. So it it must be uh, a, a unique flow where the users must be feel good and must be feel uh, um, rewarded somehow a good experience is uh, is already a good a good starting point for a good reward in the same way if you want to make a promotional activity you can put the 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 QR code in the lower part if you want the users follow your experience and also do not overload your uh, your content with QR codes you don't need to put the yeah. QR code which, for which one do I scan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you have a promotional QR code, and then you can find the one to the website. And there's a little bit of confusion where everything can be condensed in in a single experience. Yes, Super absolutely. Cool. Give give people a reason, which is back to the to the CTA, which you know 
really, really, really important. Don't just stick it in a corner and <laughs> give it no reason to be there. Because if the QR code doesn't know why it's there, why should the cons consumer scan? Jennifer, can you provide insights into the importance of storytelling, um, creating compelling connected experiences through packaging design? Yeah, so in regards to storytelling, I think the major key point here is it can be it can be it can be quite tough sometimes because you know you've got the packaging, you've got the the brand, and then sometimes the marketing team can see QR systems as just as a as a a separate entity to the business where it's a case of just gathering data. And it's important not to see it as just a, another system of gathering data, but to inject it in back into the brand. So what you don't want to do is allow your customer to scan a QR code and then it takes them into like, you know, a link where you're just entering details and it doesn't feel like it's it's integrated into the brand. What you, what you want to do is create a system where it's, it's not, it's all integrated and it feels quite flushed. So um, Adrian mentioned Lego, Lego being a great example. So it's, we've got the physical product, but we're still being taken down this journey of experience of knowing the brand and knowing what we've also purchased. So in regards to storytelling, again, you want everything to be very much aligned, still within the brand messaging and not, you don't want to feel disconnected. When yeah. you can see come out of the come come out of the platform, they you still want to know that you're ex still experiencing the brand um from start to finish. Um I'm just trying to think of any other key aspects that I can mention. Um, but I would probably say is not creating a disconnect and still yeah. see the you know, still seeing that collect, collecting data as a as as part of the brand um and the customer journey, should I say. Yeah. Makes absolute sense. To round us off, Luca, talk us through um, this particular campaign. So this is this is the longest campaign yeah. <laughs> thing that I'm aware of, which is fantastic because that takes us back from thinking about campaigns into strategy. <clears throat> and this is for Tetra Pak. Again, this is something we've worked on uh, together. Tell us, yeah. tell us a little bit about this. Well, this is a, an activity running from several years where um, Tetra Pak is trying to, to promote uh, all the environmental uh, and um, functionality aspects of their packages uh, since uh, their customer, um, they were uh, noticing that uh, their customer were not pushing so much about the, the plus of using of Tetra Pak packages. So uh, Tetra Pak started this activity uh, promoting their uh, their packages uh, plus uh, through this communication. Through the years, uh, they introduced the QR code, the QR codes, mm -hmm. which has been uh, a way to to measure in real time the uh, how much the users were really interested to this kind of, uh, of topics and to go even to, to go by themselves in detail about the content of the of the message. And uh, we are actually working together, trying to uh, to make an even better experience, changing the the author of the experiences from the from this kind of application. And this this is important because it is it, it gives to to Tetra Pak and to their customers to have a real time monitoring about uh, which are the preferences of the consumers and uh, through the quiz uh, check uh, how much uh, they are prepared about uh, yeah. the the topics okay. and to understand is... that level understand that level of knowledge based on how many people get the answers right exactly and this allow to um, to tetra Pak and to their customer to uh, to update the, the information they're providing in the moment they see the consumers are lacking about uh, uh, some topics uh, in, in this particular historical moment, uh, the focus uh, is on the environmental uh, aspects of uh, what does mean have is this kind of, of packages. And uh, this is a campaign that it is st still running and we hopefully <laughs> and we hope that uh, it will keep on running because uh, I think that with the next uh, application, uh, uh, we are going to get even closer to, to, a, 
to, to the perfect experience to provide to the consumers uh, a nice experience, uh, educational because it's not about the prices uh, or, uh, or, uh, or or give something material to, to the consumers, but to make them even more uh, aware about the, the environment uh, and the and the cartoon packages, basically. This yeah. Is no, absolutely. And the, the great thing is this runs over so many different brands and so many different countries from that data. They've got a data set to be able to compare so many different elements, like the education level, like you say. Um, so it's a fantastic uh, and, yeah, longest, longest running campaign. Again, uh, something we've um, worked on together. So thank you very much uh, to, again, uh, our international uh, panel here. So Jennifer from the UK, Luca from Italy, thank you so much for those great insights. Mm -hmm. Really, really interesting to hear all of those good tips uh, for everyone on the webinar today. Now I'm moving to Eric. Eric, thank you so much for being with us today. Eric Sorensen, you are joining us to talk about theory and testing from digital um, from digital to physical and from physical to the digital. You are managing uh, as manager global partnerships and sustainability at Modulix Group. So I'm really excited uh, for you to take us through everything you've prepared for us today. So Eric, a big welcome to you. Thank you very much, Jenny. So I'll start by saying that that usually when we talk about color theory, we focus on the challenges from in translating digital design into physical products and packaging. But I think a, a very key and unique aspect to the connected packaging experience is that you actually translate back into digital design from the physical product. So you not only have one part of the process where you where you are risking a lack of consistency in, in the branding colors, but you actually add a second one where that might be even more obvious for the for the consumer and from for the people using that that QR code and that connect connected space space. So I think it's really important um, to consider color theory within this process, starting by the fact that most brands today are digital first. Um, so design starts in the RGB scale within the, the digital design and working backwards into CMYK and Pantone colors, for example, for packaging and, and branded touch points is, is quite a nightmare, I have to be honest. So translating color accurately within both those processes is really important to make sure that, that we can actually tap into the consumer perception and the, the emotional response for clients that pick our packaging, for example, in a, in a store or our brand within the marketplace, for example, and then feel that, that there is consistency at that level. So I think we can all agree that color theory is fundamental in packaging design and in general in communicating brands and branding. Um, so a clear example of this is that some brands um, have trademarked their own color. You could say Cadbury Blue or, or uh, Purple, sorry, Apple. or <laughs> Tiffany Blue. <laughs> yeah. or Tiffany Blue, for example. Um, and all of these colors are trademarked essentially because they are used consistently and because the output is tested and is accurate according to what the brand is trying to portray. Um, a key example of how color um, is, is tapping into consumer perception and emotion is, for example, warm colors like red and orange can, can often convey energy and excitement. While if you go to more neutral colors um, like blue and green, you can evoke other feelings that are that are more neutral, you could say, and that are linked to, to trust and so on. However, there is an important aspect in, in when you are rolling out brands and packaging for brands globally, which is that it's more challenging to work on global branding and packaging colors, um, when you're trying to translate that globally into different cultures, different regions, and so on. So to give you a few examples, if you look at some Middle Eastern cultures, um, purple is actually a very royal color. So there is a proprietary use on that. If you look at green, while in Western um, cultures, we associate that with sustainability and the environment and so on. In other cultures, it, it means mourning or even um, it has a connotation about exorcism, for example. So you have to be careful on the color choices you have so that at the end of the day, your, your packaging is not only talking to people in the, the region of the world that you are designing from, but actually talking to all the perceptions and making sure that you are using a color which is we could say appropriate for a different context. Um, when we use this consistently, there's, this will always yield more success. And by ensuring that, that a brand is consistent on their color outputs, then we are essentially ensuring brand consistency and, and crit this is critical for brand success. So that's more or less um, where, where, where color theory comes into this. Consistency, as I said, is a critical 
part of this. Um, so it's not only applying about applying colors to different mediums. If we're looking at, at packaging, for example, we could be talking about how different colors behave on, on different uh, materials, paper, recycled cardboard, and so on, and how that's, this might affect the readability, for example, of QR codes and connected packaging, but also the brand representation in general. Um, but beyond how this applies to substrates, it's really important to consider cultures, as I mentioned before, also weathers, for example. So when we're representing a brand in different geographical areas of the world, some colors might be more, more prone to get, um, for example, dirty if they're um, stored externally with, with packaging or other branded touch points. And likewise, if we're looking at hot countries, for example, it's really hard to illuminate some colors or make them shine more. Um, and in terms of, of the emotional response of colors within people and consumers in general, sunny cultures, for example, prefer brighter color palettes, while Scandinavian cultures prefer going down to more neutral colors. So there's a really big difference in that. In terms of, of challenges, I think the biggest discrepancy or the biggest risk you can have is, is, a, is a difference in color output between digital design and then your real or physical product implementation, whether that is packaging or any other branded asset. Um, and then if you're going back or you're taking the consumer back through a QR code into the, the digital space, then if you're breaking that consistency once again, then it's really generating a, a very bad branding message, you could say, and might have an impact on, on how well or how, how consistently that brand is perceived. Um, the, to explain why this really is, is that when we're designing digitally, for example, with RGB scales, we are always presenting design on a screen. So these are colors that are supported by light. They exist because we have light. When we go into packaging, CMYK, for example, or, or Pantone, are color scales that are lightless or, or are simply flat colors that have no light behind them. So it's sure that there's going to be a, a difference in output between one and the other. And this is, and, and some other speakers mentioned it before, this is why testing is essential in this. You have to test all different outputs for all different colors to make sure that that the, the connected um, QR codes, for example, are efficient, but also that the brand is, is actually representative. You wouldn't want to waste the power of colors in a, in a store, for example, or within the marketplace, which is key to recognize that brand. Another risk within this process is um, the risk of interpretation. So the fact that if you do have a, a lack of consistency with that within that translation, you're diluting the impact of the brand, essentially. And this will cause issues and, and concern not only with the brand identity, but actually with compliance and readability. So in the same way that website design has certain criteria in terms of from a visibility point of view, you could say in contrast and so on, the same thing applies from every branded physical product, from, from any packaging design to actually architectural graphics, to signage, to branding all over the place. So once you start going into those little output differences, you risk um, that your product and your packaging is not readable and therefore not compliant. And this can really be a, a problem as well. So that's another aspect to consider. And to mention a last risk, which is more internal, not so much about the consumer, but about the, the organization and the brand itself is that usually what happens is that when the designer's work is done, the staff and the employees are the brand guardians. They're the people that are there to, to defend that, that consistency, you could say. If someone within a brand sees that there has been a lack of, of consistency in the output of digital design to down to packaging and, and physical representation of that, they might think that it is good enough if the colors are close. And it's very easy to understand this when we talk about font types. For example, if a font is, is X, Y, or Z, if we change that in packaging, nobody would, would accept or buy into that. It simply doesn't make any sense. But when we have small differences in color, some people might say that it's good enough. And when that starts happening, it gives the impression that some of these brand standards, you could say, can be bent. And then that generates all sorts of problems, but it essentially makes brand policing, you could say, and uh, quite complicated. And it increases that lack of consistency between digital design and physical implementation of that. This is why color testing is, I think, the key part of, of, of what I'm here to tell today and in general about color translation. Um, testing usually comes in when we're talking about manufacturing the packaging, when we're talking about the 3D rollout in general. But 
um, color translation and color theory should be a part of the creative stage of, of, of any brand design in general, whether you're working with packaging or with the total with a total rebrand, for example. So this will always come with a logo is signed off when the packaging is signed off. And then you get surprises further down the line when the, the brand has actually fallen in love with a digital color. And then they get to see how that is represented in their packaging. And they, they say, this is not what we were expecting, right? So, so color theory is not only a way to guarantee that, that a brand, for example, is satisfied with the output of their design, but it also helps the creative agencies avoid getting their partners into a, a, a path where there are going to be roadblocks further down the line. So it is more or less in, in, in every stakeholder's interest. And within testing, I think prototyping is a very interesting part, which is was also mentioned before, I believe, by, by Luca. Yeah. And prototyping is not only about doing a 3D mock-up of a product. It is also an opportunity for agencies and, and packaging companies in general to get buy-in from the brands and the clients by actually using the final product that will generate a much bigger emotional response and will get the decision-making response, essentially giving um, the, the client more or less the 100% of the information to lock in a decision that will be affecting the brand a lot of steps further down the line. So that's more or less the importance of, of testing. And two aspects that, that are more or less relevant, I think, in packaging and in general when, when you're representing brands physically are accessibility and adaptability. Accessibility refers to, for example, the visibility. When we talked about, or I explained before about um, how readable a website is, for example, the same applies in packaging. But there is also local regulation in Europe, in the US with the ADA regulation and so on, that is ensuring that the distances between information, for example, in, in packaging and, and graphics um, is enough to ensure that. And, and it is key to have a partner walk you through those different local and, and regional laws to make sure that your products are compliant, which is, is key to, to launch them. Um, and in terms of uh, adaptability, I think that it is key to include testing um, as a tool to make sure that your digital design is optimal for every different geography, every different printed medium, for example, every culture and so on. So that's more or less the importance of that. Eric, it's really, really interesting um, listening, especially when you talk about the different colors, uh, meanings for culture. You know, normally we think of uh, green for farmer and maybe blue for farmer as well. And then you said that's about exorcism somewhere yeah. else, which uh, sounds, sounds pretty horrible. Have you got any examples? Have you got anyone that you could talk about in terms of um, colouring consistencies in packaging design or an example that they got it completely wrong or something like that? I would say that the, the biggest mistakes that we've experienced is, is when we're brought in um, into a very late stage of, of rolling out that packaging and that brand. And for example, they've gone um, for colors like purple in this case. And this was a brand that, that was going to have a lot of offices and, and branded touch points in general and products within Middle Eastern countries. And, and it was simply a problem to use purple within that, that context, for example. Um, another example that we've experienced quite a lot is that if you look at, at some of the, the architectural branding more so, um, where they're using the same coloring that they will use in their in their packaging at the end of the day. But if they're using this externally, for example, and they choose white or a really clear color, um, and then that brand happened to have a lot of locations in Scandinavia, the weather really in those areas and and, and the the yeah the visibility really influences the, the, the white and the clear colors used there. So in those cases, for example, the brand is forced to go into a secondary color within their palette mm -hmm. to address a better emotional response in that in the geography, to address different weather conditions and so on. And the moment you start changing colors, that's where you lose consistency, even if it is an official color within the palette. So I think that the, the biggest you could say mistake is when when you've locked in a decision with your client and you manage to convince a brand to fall in love with it, with that choice and then you have to change that all over again it really um is 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 a hard it makes it harder to work and and decide what the output will look like yeah i absolutely completely agree with that 
Um, we've got a, a question from the audience. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to throw out there, but um, they ask if there's any size limitation for QR codes. So I don't know if I can throw that out to the, the full panel. Has anyone got any size limitation for QR codes to make sure it's readable by all smartphone models? Uh, well, from from our side, the the, the main limit uh, is is in the printing technique. So there is not a, um, a minimum size in, in general because it's strictly related to how much the, the QR code is, is complex. And so uh, the, the minimum space uh, that can be printed. So it is strictly connected to these uh, two elements, first of all. And uh, in second instance, also the device that uh, we, that is used to, to the scan. We have to consider that uh, users can have uh, an iPhone 15, but uh, they can also have an iPhone uh, of uh, six or seven, seven years old, which has a, a different uh, uh, performance of the camera. So it mm -hmm. must be also related to, to the devices in, involved in, in this process. Uh, fr from our side, uh, on average, the, uh, the definition of the QR code size uh, is determined by the, the, the printing techniques uh, and the minimal dot print, which is printable. We would, we would always recommend um, in, to be, to be more than 1.5 yeah. centimeter by 1.5 centimeter as well. If you have it too small, then no one's going to see it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and the mobile device won't be able to recognize all the all the information in, in, included. And yeah. uh, this in terms of reduction. When we talk about enlarging the QR codes, I think that <laughs> there's no limit out of the opportunity to to take it all in the camera. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Eric, were you going to say something there? Yeah, I just was going to add that we've um, sometimes, not directly on packaging, but we've made a connected user experience within, um, you could say, architectural spaces for brand um, rollouts in general. And the smallest we've gone, I think, is closer to, close to what you mentioned, Jenny, there. Um, and it's really interesting also to get to see how people can engage into a connected experience, not only in, in packaging design, but at all levels of, of brand rollouts in general, even in architectural spaces. And of course, readability is 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 crucial in that because otherwise the entire system fails. Um, so so this is more or less where, where we also come in into that. Yeah, absolutely. We're coming to the end um, of, our, of our time. Thank you, Theobald, as well. He's he's also mentioned 12.5 millimetres. So that's 1.25 centimetres. So just slightly under my recommendation of 1.5, but what's a few millimetres uh, between friends? Um, so I just want to maybe give you, our guys uh, the opportunity to think of one piece of advice or so one sentence um, that you might um, offer to our audience today. Um, I'm just going to also leave up there the QR code for anyone who wants to download the Connected Packaging um, ebook. For anyone who wants to delve a little bit more into uh, Connected Packaging, who's been interested by some of the stories and, and content today. Adrian, you're unmuting first. So I'm going to give you the opportunity first. <laughs> What's your, your one sentence, few words or piece of advice to our listeners today? I didn't know you were going to do this, Jenny. but I, I know. Thank you. I do think it from a, from a strategy's perspective, the QR code is a consumer on ramp to your own media. Love that. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric, you're unmuted, so I'm coming straight to you. Yeah, I think that from a color translation perspective, it is always going to be essential to take a collaborative approach and bring in all stakeholders within that process early in in the in the process so you can avoid any type of problem further down the line. Lovely. Jennifer, over to you. What's your one piece of advice? Know your prototype <laughs> um, and know your consumer behavior around the packaging. Yeah, really nice. Thank you. Luca, that leaves us to you. What's your one piece of advice? Uh, well, we we are both uh, designer and consumers. So, uh, as we 
Oh, it's, a, it's a very tricky question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a way to, to build a, a, a whole new world behind your brand. So, so it, it, is, it is so build your, your own board and uh, own your own media and, uh, and, do, and do whatever you consider right for your brand. Uh, now you have the opportunity to, to, to manage and check it. Yeah, I like that. It's a whole it's a whole new world, so think carefully. Is my translation for you, Luca. Thank you <laughs> so much. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much to our audience. Really lovely having you here. Thank you again for all the Q uh, QAs, the question and answers. Um, this will be available um, on YouTube, so do check it out and look forward to seeing you all at our next uh, event, which will be the Connected Packaging Summit in May. Uh, I'm sure you'll get lots of details about that. But for now. I leave you to it to think about all these fantastic pieces of advice and I wish you all a fantastic day. Thank you very much.